wonderful, wonderful to see you all and thank you so much for coming today. Uh, it's a delightful moment to be able to introduce our speaker of the day and to introduce our panelists to follow. It is that delightful moment particularly because the Foreign Policy Association is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year and those events are, are beginning to gather momentum over the next month. It's thrilling because we have a wonderful leader in our chair, Jane, Dame Gillian Sackler here, and, and a great CEO and president in Noel Latif. And the two of them have led this organization to be truly important to America's view of the world. You'll remember that the Foreign Policy Association is really the hub of the councils on, uh, of the world affairs councils around the country, about a hundred of them. And that section, series of organizations pull together about 500,000 Americans that are interested and educated and want to talk about the subjects that engage America overseas. With that, the Foreign Policy Association produces an annual seminal work called The Great Decisions. You all know about this, but it's important to just talk about its impact. It is the way that Americans look at seven or eight issues facing the country and talk about them at the World Affairs Councils to be better informed, to have the chance to debate the points of Americans for America's foreign policy, and it makes a fundamental difference in the way we see uh, our country and the way we affect the politicians who ultimately make the decisions. Today we have a panel that is going to include a renowned statesman, a professor of renown, uh, a, a very well-known economist, and an international lawyer, also an economist. I'll talk about those people in a second, but I'd like to begin by introducing our keynote speaker. He is the Right Honorable the Lord Howell of Guilford. I'm going to compress his resume because it goes on for many, many pages. The number of articles that Lord Howell has written in the last two years alone goes on for pages. He's a prolific writer and commentator, but he's also a critical person in the British government and in the statesmanship of the UK. He's the former Secretary of State for Energy. He's the former Secretary of State for Transportation. He was a Minister of State in the Foreign Office, and he serves as the chair of the House of Lords International Relations Committee. Lord Howell has been an important commentator in, in favor of Brexit and how it can make a difference in the globalized world. He's been an important commentator on the importance of the British Commonwealth in a new era. And he has been an important commentator on understanding that digital communications in a world where seven billion people have access to seven billion cell phones, that is the number, that our diplomacy changes, the world changes, and both his country and the West's role change. So with that, I hope you'll give a strong applause to Lord Howe. Well, thank you, Hugh, for that um, uh, kind introduction and for that um, sensitive selection from the full criminal record. Uh, thank you for what you left out as well as what you put in. Um, I'm, of course, enormously honored and flattered to have the opportunity of addressing Foreign Policy Association, a very distinguished, renowned organization of great uh, age and authority, and also, of course, standing very clearly down, down the decades for the, the democracy and rules-based order and the rule of law, which uh, we all stand for, and which, frankly, today is under intense attack. And I want to share a few thoughts with you on the nature of that attack and how we stand against it. Um, I notice the word world leadership is the key word at your conference. And really, I'm going to start by saying something which I will have to put carefully. I don't want to shock, dismay, or uh, undermine, or, or lose too many friends. But when it comes to world leadership and the theme of this conference, I'm really going to bring you some good news and some 
bad news um, to this particular audience in this great nation where we're standing now. The good news is obvious to you, but needs asserting around the world, that the United States of America remains much the most successful world economy with the biggest financial, commercial, and indeed cultural footprint across the planet. No one can take away that from you. You're also the world's largest oil producer, slightly ahead of Saudi Arabia, which is a useful thing to have in your back pocket in these dangerous times for world trade and energy. The bad news is this, that the new kind of transformed network world, which Hugh just mentioned, in which we now live, requires an entirely different kind of leadership from the kind that the United States has sought to provide in the recent past, or I have to sadly record, is providing now. Why is that so? That is so because a network world where every country, every interest, every region, every locality is connected up is a great equalizer. The old hierarchy model of superpowers does not really work anymore. Gone are the days of what used to be called American primacy, when overwhelming force, shock and awe, and sheer military weight were the instruments of power or the way to take the lead. In the digital aid, it is the incredible web of networks, the lattice work of constant connectivity, operating across every continent and at every level of society, which provides the means to safeguard security and prosperity, and the means also of securing and promoting national interests and giving an effective lead, um, and also, of course, a means of, uh, as it can be used, in less and more negative terms, for confusing the world with avalanches of fake news and manufactured facts. So, to, in fact, what I'm saying to you is that today there are good networks and bad networks, good cells and bad cells. And the best can be, if we use it and develop it, the new means for what is labeled, I always think sometimes mis misleadingly, as projecting soft power through which influence and impact are now increasingly transmitted and upholding the rules-based order, as I mentioned. In Britain, we are slowly learning some important lessons. We are moving away from the old discredited EU model of political integration and protectionism and working out how to survive and prosper in our country in an entirely different world. We are developing a new cat's cradle of bilateral links and relationships in all kinds of areas, not just governmental, but professional, educational, scientific, medical, cultural, and of course, trade in all its modern guises, which is utterly different from trade 20 years ago, which is increasingly through services and through online data transmission, digital fabrication, and so on. One of our most promising networks, as we see things from London, in this new world, which has been sadly neglected but recently rediscovered, is the gigantic system of like-minded Commonwealth countries, all with a common working language, similar legal and accountancy systems, and except in one or two cases, very uh, common values and attitudes, and a commitment to a democratic government and the rule of law. We see this very much as a family, although of course even families have awkward members and disagreements, as we all know. But um, today's Commonwealth contains one third of the whole human race. That's 2.4 billion people. A bigger network even than China, as I sometimes get some pleasure in telling the Chinese ambassador in London. It contains some of the world's smallest and poorest states, but also some of the fastest growing and dynamic I refer to India, Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, your neighbor, Nigeria, South Africa, and Singapore. Those are just some of the names that come to mind. And on top of that, Africa is rising, I think much more quickly than a lot of the commentators understand. These are regions which are growing into some of the biggest middle-income consumer markets in history. In history. They are the ones which we have to fight in and succeed in to prosper. And i give you an example of, I was talking to a, last night to a, a powerful delegation of, um, from Zimbabwe. 
Zimbabwe, which actually left the Commonwealth in a fury under Mugabe some years ago. Now they want to return. It won't be easy because they've got to conform to to certain the values and standards of the, which the Commonwealth insists on. But that gives you an idea of how, in, in this strange new world of networks, that there are more and more countries, Zimbabwe is one, Angola is another, uh, Burundi is another, Suriname is another, who are queuing up to join the Commonwealth Club, not to solve all their problems, not to solve all their problems, but to be part of an integrated network of would-be democracies or growing democracies in a, in a very dangerous world. Now, looking at the world in this new way puts some of the nastiest global problems in some degree of perspective. Uh, the United States of America, I speak as a Brit, is still very much our best friend and partner, but you are not our boss. No one is, the new inter is, in, is the boss in the new international network system. Uh, you face, you hear, when I come to New York or Washington, that the main enemies are Russia and China. Well, Russia is a weak state, um, temporarily empowered by using cyber technologies and digital weapons. Um, and of course, uh, the price of oil at the moment keeps it up and warped by sort of James Bond versions of poisoning and assassination. I have to say in brackets that the sight of these two gangsters I think KGB men <coughs> claiming they visited Salisbury because they knew the height of the spire of the cathedral, but it was too cold in the snow to go and look at it, left us laughing, I'm afraid, and ridiculing Russia, which is quite good at ridiculing us, but this time the laughs on the, the, laughs on the other foot. Um, with a GDP smaller than Italy, two-thirds of the UK, and one-fifth of the United States, it is simply relying on temporarily high uh, flows of oil and gas revenues and a lot of plausible and often ludicrous propaganda to make its mark. <clears throat> Russia is far feebler today than Stalinist USSR ever was and has no great cause or creed to offer followers as communism did and as millions of students did in the, the Bandung generation 40 years ago. As for your other declared enemy, China, this, uh, the Chinese spend a fortune on trying to promote their soft power image through their Confucius and Mencius outreach operations in many countries, and now including through their heavy infrastructure investment across the continents, through the Belt and Road Initiative, um, its huge Africa investments. Xi Jinping was saying the other day they were now worth $60 billion. Um, and its new railways, its property purchases, and much else besides. The kind of soft penetration is seen by Beijing as far more effective in extending Chinese power than conventional hard power advance, although China is not averse to some of that in the China South Seas, where they try and keep um, Western American naval and Western naval presence away from them manufactured islands, which they claim are for peaceful purposes, but of course are bristling with um, rockets and combat fighters. So none of this Chinese expansionism signaled by Xi Jinping is actually going to be countered by conventional military means, such as missiles or invasions, or I, f I think frankly even by trade wars, although that is the current American belief. It is minds that have to be won over. To, to, to the better story that the democracies can offer. It's a question of winning the narrative. And we have to do that not by lecturing the world on how the Western powers are so superior in every respect, because actually the truth is that our tired systems and brands of democracy may not be so marvelous and may produce some very odd results and indeed have done so. We have to do it by the most subtle, new, and public forms of diplomacy, which are only just now being developed. As for the tortured Middle East, the new age lessons from there should be clear by now. Humanitarian, educational, technical, and soft power support should be given to the full to these fragile or collapsed societies. That may eventually pay off. But I, in my view, heavy political and military invention won't pay, intervention won't pay off, nor will the attempt to, cr to crush Iran by um, sanctions. I, I, I say to you, let the Russians sink into their own quagmire 
And even inside, in Russia today, there's a lot of protests and complain about what they see as expensive and pointless Middle East region involvement, with more and more Russian boys being brought home in coffins. So let our alliance be with peaceful Islam, not with a violent jihadist strain, which we all need to, to do everything domestically and internationally together to snuff out. And that's where the word together becomes crucially important. Friends, we all have to play the long game because in the end our liberal values have more staying power than the autocracies or the old, old extreme ideologies of the 20th century and the polarized arguments in which too much political debate is still conducted. But it will all require a lot of patience, a lot of understanding, a lot of respect for newer and advanced nations, a lot of respect, I emphasize, and a truly deep grasp of the revolutionary new trends and patterns of, of um, international behavior which the digital age and the cyber age have imposed on us all. And of that, I fear, to end on a slightly low note, there seems not very much evidence amongst our rulers at present. However, as politicians and those in public life, and indeed everyone else in our two nations, we all have to live in hope. Thank you very much.